Hey everyone, so I know many of you find James Tour to be an endless source of comedy, just like I do, and given his history of slander towards me, I feel justified in laughing at his pathetic apologetics in perpetuity. Well, there's a bit more of that to be had today, so let's see what he's been up to and laugh together, shall we? So the last time we checked in with James, he was busy pretending our debate never happened and spewing the same ridiculous script I debunked in real time out into the internet looking for a better result. This involved targeting nine Origin of Life researchers, plus Bruce Lipschitz for some reason, as though they might acknowledge him as anything more than a lunatic shrieking on a street corner and try to teach him the science he's been ignoring for years. Well, the 60 days have elapsed, emboldening James to continue spewing his script, which he begins by upgrading his claim to say that we are utterly clueless, followed by disingenuously referencing his favorite Lee Cronin tweet. If all they did was answer one of those five questions, I'd take down everything. I'd stop bothering them. They couldn't do it. They couldn't answer it. So I'm not going to take out down anything. And remember what I told you, that if they can't answer any of the five, I will stop saying that we are clueless, but I'll start saying that we are utterly clueless. The entire area of origin of life is an absolute scam. Origin of life research is a scam. Okay, it was tongue in cheek, but yeah, I think, and I meant it yeah. um, as tongue in cheek. This time, James forgets to trim out the part where Lee explains how he wasn't serious about the tweet. That's what tongue-in-cheek means. It means in an ironic, flippant, or insincere way, which means he doesn't think it's a scam. That's how dumb James knows his viewers are. He is showing them that he's a liar, and nobody cares. Here are the 10 experts who wrote the papers that the YouTuber cites. They are confessing that their papers don't answer the questions because they didn't have the answers. Bless his little heart, he doesn't understand that they don't respond because he's a fraud not worth acknowledging. At this point, most of my viewers who don't even have a background in chemistry could point out prebiotically plausible syntheses of polypeptides and polynucleotides, like the ones we discussed during the debate. He just keeps pretending they don't exist because he's a lying preacher. And this attempt to brush aside stacks of literature with the empty claim of this is incorrect and lies about 15 steps and deep protections is just pathetic. He doesn't actually address this paper because he can't, since it proves him wrong about even his ultra-specific sidechain straw man. The only one to respond to me was uh, Lee Cronin, like, uh, and Lee Cronin kindly said that my questions were not relevant. The questions were not relevant for the origin of life. I'm not sure how that can be, but what he agreed to do is to meet with me. We were invited to the Harvard University Roundtable. He and I are going to be at Harvard on November 28th. So as it turns out, Lee emailed James to tell him off, though the entire email is blurred, so we won't know what else was said other than that his questions are irrelevant. But of course, the DI capitalized on this shred of acknowledgement and coerced Lee to come to Harvard in a desperate attempt to continue presenting James as a legitimate academic. Anyway, that event happened a couple weeks ago, and it was very amusing, to say the least. It consisted of James and Lee each speaking for a little bit, followed by a conversation over dinner, and then a discussion panel. Throughout the entire event, James looks like someone who won a radio contest to sit with real scientists for an evening, as he pretty much just sits there slumped over and zoned out, only speaking when spoken to, usually wondering what the hell everyone is talking about. But let's start from the top so we can get the broad perspective. First up, James makes his statement. Well, thank you for the invitation. And uh, we're just going to go through this. Let me give you a few definitions. Abiogenesis is the origin of life from non-living matter. To construct any convincing theory of abiogenesis, we must take into account the condition of the Earth about four billion years ago. Not my definition. This is from uh, Merriam-Webster. What's this? Is James Tour reading from a script? I thought only incompetent YouTubers read from scripts. The man could not speak without a script. He has people write it. You yeah. could do it. You could do it. When you, you could do it. You could do it. Okay, James, read your script. I am not speaking of a god of the gaps. I think that we will one day find out uh, uh, how life began. By that, of course, he means that one day we will all abandon science and just blindly believe that his god of the gaps made life by magic. 
But I don't think we are anywhere close, nowhere close. And how can I say this? It's because as we track the complexity of a cell and how close we are being able to reproduce this, build a cell, uh, uh, even mimicking what's here, what happens is every year the cell gets further away from us because its complexity increases with time. Predictably, James is off to the races, spewing his pathetic talking points about how unbelievably complex modern cells are, interactomes, and all kinds of other features that are the product of four billion years of evolution. You all know as well as I do that James is not here for good faith conversation or to update his script of lies even one iota. So let's just highlight a few things he says about Lee. Professor Cronin's older work, he tried to make oligopeptides by some prebiotic-like route. It was a bunch of garbage. There was nonsense there. And, and uh, uh, same thing with saccharides, because this is hard. You try to make these sugars. We made billions of compounds. It's very hard to do this. You try to push molecules toward life. They don't want to go. They don't know to move toward life. They have no brain. They don't want to evolve toward life. There's no impetus to do this. This is just James pointing at science he doesn't understand and calling it garbage. We discussed both of these papers in earlier debunks, and it's great research. Lee makes oligopeptides by prebiotic means, and he demonstrates how sugars can be made by the foremost reaction in a more directed way in the presence of certain mineral surfaces. James just whines about molecules not wanting to move towards life because he's a complete fraud who wants to pretend that an experiment about biomolecule synthesis was somehow supposed to produce a living organism. Furthermore, molecules don't want to move towards life. I thought molecules didn't care about life, which of course they don't. They simply obey the laws of the molecular world. Now James is pretending that they resist being incorporated into living organisms? What fresh insanity is this? Professor Cronin now speaks of the general primordial soup model saying it's a good model with no rationale for what makes it good and what chemistry is involved. I don't know if you know the primordial soup model where you have a pond, and in that pond are some molecules, lightning strikes, molecules form higher order structures, those form a cell. And those cells now form higher order structures and you get creatures living in the pond. And then those creatures evolve and they come out of the pond. That's the primordial soup model. You know where that came from? You think that came from Miller Urey? No. You think that came from Darwin? No. That came from the Babylonians. And out of that pond where life came from, came their gods as well. You want to take those? It's nonsense. No one is surprised that James continues to spew this tripe about the primordial soup model no matter how many times he's exposed. But these upgrades just get dumber and dumber. Now it's not just magical lightning creatures slithering out of the pond, but the Babylonians got their gods this way? What the hell is he even talking about at this point? The Babylonians didn't know that molecules exist, James. By the way, it's common knowledge that Hebrew mythology, like your favorite book, borrows tremendously from Babylonian mythology, so if you're saying their myths are crap, then so are yours. Great job admitting that you're also clueless about theology. Anyway, the rest is just James screaming the same ridiculous quote mines and lies he served up in the debate and in all of his content, so there's no point in repeating myself from previous debunks. Let's move on to Lee's statement. In short, Lee speaks calmly and rather coherently about some concepts relevant to his research. This is interesting for those in the audience who are interested in science, but ineffective for those who need to be shown with crystal clarity how James just lied to them for 20 minutes. This is the difference between a science communicator like myself and a scientist like Lee. When I meet with James, my purpose is to show the world what a lying fraud he is. When Lee meets with James, it's an opportunity to present his science. This is this isn't to say that Lee should have used his time in any other way, but it would have been fun to watch Lee mock Jim's pathetic script. He could have asked why he keeps showing diagrams depicting features of modern eukaryotic cells, as though they have anything to do with abiogenesis. He could have briefly summarized some known prebiotic methods for arriving at relevant biomolecules, and pointed out the dishonesty in Tor's fixation on an ultra-specific dipeptide and polynucleotide linkages that don't negate polymer function. But one thing he did do was slam James for his repeated misuse of a facetious tweet. I don't think Origin of Life is a scam. That was a joke, if you can listen to the podcast. And it's not just a joke, it was meant to prompt people to say, hey, Origin of Life has made fantastic progress. Shostak in RNA, uh, Benner in looking at complex systems, Pauner, Sutherland, all these people. But I think they're thinking quite in a, in a very particular way, and there's a broader picture. That was what I was meaning. 
Anyone want to take any bets as to whether James will keep using this tweet whenever he wants, even though Lee just told James to his face how full of shit he is? And it's really important that we have a wide church when we're pre-paradigm. If you go back to the time of electricity, when the Volters and the Ampers were having an argument, when Edison and Tesla were trying to work out what the best way to distribute our electricity, it was not a clean progress. It was lots of argument, but I'm trying to keep my voice low. <laughs> I guess your eardrums have already been rattled, rattled a little bit. Apart from this moment, alluding to how James is constantly shouting like a toddler, Lee is quite generous in not exposing James too harshly, likely fancying himself above it, which is fine. So let's get the gist of Lee's work with assembly theory. So I figure that in my lab, maybe it's not two years, maybe it's not five years, but we should be able to create the conditions where we start to see selection and evolution before biology. A very reasonable statement, since this has already been observed for decades through the work of Gerald Joyce and other people working in systems chemistry, an area James continues to pretend isn't real. I developed with my team a new approach to counting those bonds. Jim talked to the graphs in the Nature paper saying these are, you know, this is just nonsensical. They're graphs, mathematical objects. They're not schema. I didn't say in the, in the legend they were, they were reaction diagrams. That's a massive misquote and a disservice. P writing a paper in Nature requires that you interact not just with the chemists, but all the other really smart people want to understand what you've done, as well as the generalists. So dressing it up in this kind of hierarchy of you don't know what you're talking about and intimidating you into not thinking is not the way I do science. And I suggest we should not do that here. We should ask ourselves, what are the questions? Lee basically scolds James for pretending to understand the research he is shallowly criticizing. So assembly theory is actually very simple. It's about the possible formation of, of objects. Um, assembly pathways start with a basic set of building blocks and allow joining and reuse. It's a bit like you give a child and say, right, start here. Let's just take abracadabra. And you can do that, again, with graphs mm. that look like molecules. These are not reactions, they're graphs. You can do it with blocks. The assembly equation is this quantity called assembly is actually you can calculate to tell you the amount of memory that basically has gone into, or amount of selection that's gone into making a thing. It has three things I should tell you about. It is the complexity of the object, and it is this. This is the next simple thing. If you take an object, cut it up with a pair of scissors in your head, you can cut it up to basically um, minimize the reuse on a graph. Abracadabra, just imagine that, put it on a graph. You then count how many copies of, of the object you have, and the larger the number of copies and the larger the assembly index, the more you're sure it came from evolution. That's the basic premise. Lee is a bit too smart for his own good in thinking that these ideas can be transmitted so simply in a way that conveys the sophistication only he in the room is aware of. But this is the nature of this type of science. It's fundamentally too complex to convey in a soundbite. And unfortunately, it does not give the tour follower what they need to hear regarding the dishonesty of the apologist script. But from here, we move on to the roundtable discussion. This is a totally new experience for James. He's used to lecturing crowds of brainwashed Christians. Now he has to sit at a table with educated people, and you can immediately see his demeanor change. From fiery preacher to perplexed toddler. For the better part of an hour, intelligent people have stimulating conversation, while James just sits there, completely incapable of intervening with a comment even a single time. I'm not exaggerating. For the entire roundtable, he speaks only when spoken to, and even in those moments, only offers unintelligible garbage. Here are a few highlights. First, we have a fellow who asks James about hypothetical scientists hundreds of years in the future who admit that early 21st century science on the topic was far off the mark, but they have a machine that can create cells. The ideas we had about like the chemistry of the uh of the emergence of life now were like hopelessly simplistic. You needed all kinds of new ideas. And, but they also show you their machine where they can like, you know, at one end, like they pour in whatever, some sugar or whatever, some, whatever simple things you're meant to pour in. And at the other end, you know, the day later you get cells and they can like take you through and they 
you know, they can describe the, the whole process for you. It's like entirely convincing that it could have emerged like this on, on, on Earth. Do you, feel, do you feel vindicated or do you feel like uncomfortable because of your religious views? Oh, I, I feel, so, so I, I didn't inject any religious convictions that's in, not in my, my talk. That's true. Okay. But, but nevertheless, but, you have some. So. Oh, I absolutely do, but I just wanted to put that out there. But no, I feel totally vindicated. I feel totally vindicated because I think that there's phenomena that, so the, the molecules in my mind are fighting against moving toward life. And you really push them, push them, you use all sorts of ingenuity. In Lee's lab, he has all these robots adding in certain orders and certain times and certain chemicals. And you keep pushing them toward it, and it's so hard to have them move toward life. James can't even get his own story straight. Again, this bit used to be that molecules have never been shown to move towards life. Now he is saying they actively fight against being pushed towards life. What does this even mean? He is ascribing them sentience and also stubbornness? And he pretends his religious convictions have nothing to do with this, or maybe he just can't remember which lies he told in which setting. But the funniest part is that the guy asked him a very clear question. In the future, there is a machine that takes raw ingredients and makes cells. So by running this idiotic script about molecules not going towards life, he's just pretending the question doesn't exist. Then he just blatantly pivots to one of his dumb talking points. So just recently, just in the last couple of days, Dimitar Susilov here at Harvard has used chiral-induced spin selectivity to help him to get crystallization to, to enhance chirality in some crystals. This is using this new phenomenon. You see that, hey, maybe there is a route to really enhance chirality through a new phenomenon that wasn't even around when I was in school. Then he tries to remember what Watson and Crick did and appears to have a stroke. So if somebody can duplicate life, that's great, just like when, when, uh, when Watson and Crick published the, 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 the genome, the, the way. Then the guy who asked the question tries to wrangle him back from fantasy land. That's right. So just to be clear, at yes. the beginning you said, at the very beginning of your talk, you said that you think we will figure it out. Yes. But it was a very brief statement. So just to be clear, so you do believe, like, in the end, there's a naturalistic explanation. For yeah, the emergence I, of life. Yeah, I think that we're going to see, just just like we, we I'm, I'm using the analogy of the genetic code, where we're going to go, oh, Lord, that's how you did it. That's how you did it. That's how information is stored. So when asked point blank whether James thinks we will find a naturalistic explanation for how life arose, his answer is, yes, we will figure out how God did it. I mean, the guy really is getting dumber every single day. The philosopher in the group picks up on this hypocrisy and makes a clarifying statement. Well then, if molecules don't move towards life by themselves, yes. and life somehow evolved from molecules, then the missing X factor must be either natural or supernatural. It must be either the environment That's or right. a creator, right? James, you are saying molecules can't just form living organisms, so you are insisting that it must be God, right? James doesn't even respond, so Lee jumps in to save him, but actually dumps on him even more. I, I'm really, Jim, I don't really know what your agenda is. It's a bit weird if you've, because on the one hand, you're so angry and aggressive against just the process of normal science, right? It's like you're saying, oh, this is garbage and that's an idiot and that's a loser and they don't know anything. That's the process of science, right? We come up with models, we refute them in a civil way. I think we make more progress by doing it in a civil way. And then we go, oh, I don't know why, wh who your audience is. I came here tonight hoping you weren't going to get up there and shout and, 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 and misquote. And, I'm, and I refuse to get in that conversation. I came here in good faith. What I would say is there's something super interesting what's going on. And the reason why I came here tonight wasn't to address your ludicrous claims, um, was more to say, hey, let's, let's, get, let's, let's put our best foot forward for new scientists out there. People are skeptical. People want to learn more and find where the new interesting problems are in science. And a minute later, another juicy bit from Lee. 
nuanced. We should criticise, absolutely, and you're right to say, no, I don't accept that, That's, that doesn't pass my test scientifically. But if you do it in a way that doesn't make people scared to engage, why do you think none of those people engage with you? They didn't engage, engage with you because you were, it sounded, looked look like the rantings of a person that when, were not wanting to have a discussion. And so, and I know you a little bit, I know some of the chemistry you do, it's great. So I came here to kind of de-amplify de that and have a more nuanced conversation. This would be a good opportunity for James to jump in and own up to what a complete lunatic he's become, but instead he remains silent, and a physicist decides to jump in on the dog pile. I think we want to know, I'm kind of interested in what you're doing in your lab toward this problem, and why, why you think these people, who I, many of whom I know, are scam artists, because I... I'm pretty sure they're not. Yeah. And I, I think they're real scientists and very good scientists. I, I don't know about Lee, but I don't know him, but I'm interested in what you want to happen. So I don't think that anybody is setting out to scam anybody. I, I don't think that anybody's out to scam, intentionally scamming people. Origin of life research is a scam. Origin of life research is a scam. Flip that script, James. Tuck your tail. Dance your dance. This whole table knows what a fraud you are. I think that what happens is when you say that we'll have life in the lab in three years, when we have life in the lab of five years, that's a disservice to the field. When on the other side you get into a professional meeting and you say, I can't even make the RNA. And there's a long distance between the RNA and life. Well, RNA has been made prebiotically by dozens of researchers, dozens of different ways, so that was a dumb thing to say. It be You're a scientist, right? You know that I may say I'm going to find the top quark in 10 years and it took me 27. I mean, it doesn't mean that I'm lying or scamming or, that, that's exactly or it's not that, a disservice, though. It's also not a disservice. In nanotechnology, Jim, where you've made claims about what you're going to do in your lab and you haven't done those. You know, you have produced patterns. Arguably, they've gone somewhere, but you haven't done the things you said you were going to do. Does that make you working in bad faith? Yeah, so, so you, you're, make, you're making all good points, Lee. What I think is that you're coming around. Yes, Lee is coming around to shitting all over you for the ridiculous things you say on the internet. Look at what an unbelievable narcissist James is. This woman confronts him about how he is constantly calling origin of life researchers frauds and scam artists. He has no response. Lee confronts him for whining about other researchers not following through on projections when he does this himself all the time. He has no response. He is completely and utterly incapable of admitting fault, of acknowledging how atrocious his behavior is. He just will never do it. And the only reason he isn't shouting at the top of his lungs right now is because nobody at the table has it in them to rub this in his face over and over again until his psyche starts to crumble, like I did to him in the debate. What does he do instead? He brings up the Lee quote that Lee just scolded him about an hour earlier. Like when the, in the interview that I read from Lex Fridman, and you know, I read a long paragraph. He read a long paragraph, but for some reason all he ever shares is that one tweet. James should become a politician. He is basically a human-shaped pile of grease. Just look at how he unabashedly trots out this idiotic story about science textbooks yet again, despite me having completely humiliated and exposed him on this very talking point. So we as a community have put forward something that is grossly incorrect, information that is grossly incorrect, that is starting in textbooks from the elementary school level, and the primordial soup model is taught not just into college, but into advanced college classes, that model. It's just unbelievable that he has the balls to keep spewing this talking point. Here's a great moment where Lee and another scientist make an important clarification regarding something in physics that James is clueless about. 
Everything on planet Earth that has been through biology is a product of selection, be it this glass, me, the silverware. And it's, and it's selection, it requires the following things. Random events happen, and the thing doesn't persist in time. It is erased, it dies. Anything that, pro, that can exist in time has to be copied in some way, whether it's a meme or a piece of RNA or the photographs on your thumb drive to keep them in play. That is something very critical that we're not seeing that goes through chemistry. And, and actually, the, um, the um, thermodynamics actually favors this because everybody talks about equal, uh, um, equilibrium thermodynamics. That's the theory we're all taught. And not about Prigozhin's work and non-equilibrium thermodynamics which says simply that if you have enough species to start with, chemical species, you're sufficiently far from equilibrium, which describes pretty much all of the universe that we, we know, and you continue to import free energy, like this planet, or then it is inevitable yep. Yep. that ever more complicated regimes evolve. I mean, like and this is mathematics. It's, 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 it's been proven and it's been verified at the simple chemical level with, with various kinds of reactions that simply do that, set up that experiment. So that to me says life is inevitable. Just wait long enough because we started. Why England was doing it. Freeland and my paper did explicitly the thermodynamics of it, you know, favors metastable states, not the stability that you guys are looking for, but metastable states that have a differing um, uh, lifetime. You know, and, and this is key, so it's all selection. Well, nothing lasts, ultimately. And, yeah, and, and the same is true for any yeah. individual life or for life itself. And it goes way back before the cell ever became. This is exactly what I was talking about in my very first response to James, where I showed some papers from Eigen and others regarding life as a manifestation of the second law of thermodynamics, which describe complex systems as inevitably emerging when matter tries to dissipate free energy gradients. It's no surprise that James has no response and probably was just daydreaming about Jesus the whole time this guy was talking. Lee even confronts James about his God of the Gaps and he has no response. A lot about what Galileo did, and I'm no Galileo, but I do think that there is a that there are segment in society that that want to cause a the god of the gaps. And I'm sorry, Jim, I actually think you're just trying. You, there's a god in the gaps. I've looked at it very clearly. You say on one hand, I accept it's going to be solved, and on the other hand, you so vociferously make arguments about, hey, I hate the way science works. When you do that yourself in your own science, be it nanotransistors, new conductors, new catalysts. So you kind of move the goalposts. And I disagree that it's get, the problem is getting bigger and the goalposts are moving in the past. That's not what's happening. That is, Jim is very, very nicely paying a sleight of hand here by saying and this and this and this, missing the key shift that has to happen in the discipline. That's right, segments of society want to inject religion into science, and Lee accurately labels James as part of that movement. James does believe in a god of the gaps, no matter how much he claims otherwise. He lies, he shifts goalposts using sleight of hand. These are all things I said to Jim's face in the debate, but this time James remains stone-faced and keeps his mouth shut. And with that, we wrap up the roundtable conversation and move on to the final portion, a panel that is really just an extension of the previous discussion, but with everybody watching. And the most delicious humiliation for James will happen here. Let's check it out. Most of you perhaps are interested in the implications of a scientific study of the origin of life. What are the implications on religion? And so I would like to ask both of you, Jim and Lee, to comment on your personal opinion on what do you think are the implications of origin of life research on religion. Yes, let's talk about religion, that thing James pretends has nothing to do with his script of lies regarding science. First we get Lee's answer. I, so I think it goes broader than religion, it's not, it's about culture, and I'd like to expand it to say we, hum, humanity is interested in what we are, what life is. We want to know if we're alone in the universe. We want to know if there are aliens. 
Um, we want to know what's the future of life on Earth. So I think um, it's not just about the religious implications, about re the implications for humans as thinking beings, understanding the place of life and how special or common we are in the universe. So I can't, I'm not an expert from thinking about a religious point of view, but I do detect when I talk to people, there's a strong wish to understand, have meaning, understand the future of our culture. That was a bit abbreviated, but you get the picture. Now on to James. For me, I mean, my faith in Jesus Christ means more than me than anything. I love him so much. And from what I understand of the scriptures, it is clear that all things have been created by him and for him. You don't have to know him in this sense to do science. Many great scientists have, have no faith in the Lord at all. But what it does is it gives you a greater appreciation, I think, that the scientist has when they behold these things that other people have never really seen or been able to ponder before. In all the generations that have gone before us, uh, to think that these interactions are occurring. And so for me, if, if when, when someday we figure this out, how life can come about, I think it makes, it makes the Lord all the more magnanimous in my eyes because it's, oh, this is how you did it. This is how it could be done. And uh, uh, I just don't think we're near that today, and I don't know that we'll discover this in my lifetime. And of course, James can't help but parade his true colors, flat out admitting that he believes everything was created by God, including life. So he is publicly announcing that every time he pretends we will find a naturalistic explanation for the origin of life, he's lying. And his crusade against this field is a religious one. Not that a single person is surprised by this answer, it's just humorous that he will say these things out loud and later pretend he didn't. We don't really work, per se, on, on origin of my life in my lab. I mean, I, I certainly look at it and critique it, but uh, I am longing for the answer. This whole thing of chiral-induced spin selectivity, I saw it from Ram Naman, one of the, the discoverers of this, about 20 years ago when I was visiting him in Israel. And now to see that, that what it's beginning to opening, open up. And this is why I said there's going to be many more phenomena that I think we're going to have to discover. It's, it's quite, I think it's quite wrong for us to think that we understand reaction chemistry. There is no difference between James and a politician. He gets asked a question, spews some garbage that contradicts his earlier comments, then he inserts some random phenomenon that has nothing to do with anything, then he tells a pointless story. It's just astounding. Now watch what happens as James wraps up this train wreck and tries to move on, but a panelist won't let him to see all the things that God has discovered just because I can look at a leaf on a tree out there and, and know that there's a magnesium atom sitting in a porphyrin and I know light funnels into that thing and you eject an electron and get photosynthesis and the poor guy on the street who doesn't know the science can't get that appreciation. It gives me an enhanced view of, of, of the glory of, of the creation of God. We have a follow-up question here, no, Jim? Actually, we're going to have to move on to you, you say on your website, other people. That you do not agree with the intelligent design conclusion. Yet your work is widely used by the Discovery Institute and many other creationist organizations, okay. organizations as a as support for the view that the failure to have a naturalistic origin of life helps to support the idea of a creator. Could you comment on that? Kudos to this guy, because James is constantly distancing himself from the intelligent design movement, despite just admitting about five times in answering the previous question that he believes everything was designed by God, and that his understanding of nature makes him appreciate the God who designed everything. Shall we see how he tries to weasel out of this one? Yeah, well, I absolutely believe in a creator, for sure, and I say that on my website. And, and in six days, God created the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. I don't know what the length of the day is, if we can qu quantify it based on, on our perspective today. But, but uh, so I certainly believe in creation. And I, I'm very explicit on why I don't 
don't uh, support the, the intelligent design directly. I say I'm sympathetic to it. It's just that I don't have a tool to assess design. Now, I know people are now trying to come up with measures of design. I don't have a spectroscopic tool. I don't have a mass spec tool. I don't have an analytical tool. So I hold my colleagues to the same thing that I want to hold myself to. Show me the data. This is just pathetic. He is outright stating that he believes God created everything exactly as it is in six days because scripture told him so, but he is pretending that he needs some kind of data from the idiots at the DI in order to support them, something he is already objectively doing for money. This is tricky territory for James and the DI. They want James to appear like an academic, since he's the only one among them who can, as he's the only one who's a real scientist. But the DI is famously known as anti-science propaganda all across academia. How do you try to milk someone for academic credibility when their affiliation with you saps them of all their academic credibility? That's why this gets so uncomfortable for James, and it's absolutely glorious to watch. But you allow all of your work to be used as evidence. It's not a matter of allowing. I mean, how can I stop it? I mean, people well, take my videos permission. to... You've given permission Even if I say, no, no, you, you, you... Oh, permission to be published? That, as part of the evidence. Oh, if people take my written material and publish it in their papers, I can't restrict can't them. It. It's published. Okay. So I can't say, no, 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 you can't publish it. I have no, that's, that's up to them. Okay. So it's, I've never given permission, so and I've gonna, never denied gonna, permission. We're going to pause use it. for the sake of the audience. I, I failed to introduce other people besides Jim and Lee. This moderator is handpicked by the DI, just like the moderator for my debate. So here he is right on cue to jump in and save James by changing the subject. It's time for the next question, which comes from the philosopher. So my question is, suppose that we had, we discovered some very natural explanation of what was previously thought to be a miracle, uh, which is possible. Uh, in the book of Exodus, it's described in one chapter as a miracle, God rolled the Red Sea apart. And in another chapter, it's described by a natural explanation, the wind blew the, the thing apart. Uh, how do you distinguish what's miraculous and supernatural versus what's, what's natural? Uh, you, you know, uh, um, I wish I were a better philosopher it, so that I could talk about this intelligently. Yes, James, it's your ineptitude with philosophy that's the problem, not that your baseless faith forces you to lie about science. Um, certainly the miraculous is something that, that doesn't normally occur. That doesn't mean that, that but, but certainly we, we have many things that could occur that don't happen routinely. Well, so you distinguishing occur, those. You're not a miracle. I'm sorry? You don't normally occur. None of us is, uh, each of us is an exception. We're, we're, we're not clones. So how can you use the frequency of occurrence as a distinction between the natural and the No, that, that's a good point. I mean, the problem is I'm talking with a philosopher, and you guys can just dance around me. I, there's, <laughs> there, there, there's no way I can really compete, Peter. James is basically just admitting that he's too stupid to answer the question. So let's move on to the next bit where Lee dumps on James some more for his dismissive attitude. Right, and, I'm, and I think if you're just saying a problem and then saying rather magnanimously later, say, well, you know, I think it's going to be solved. I think there's something odd going on there. It's really important if we're doing science in, a, in, a, in the way that I, I think is going to be productive, problems are really interesting. Problems, we shouldn't be finding problems and shouting at each other, saying, there's a problem that this doesn't work. You know, fusion, it's impossible because no one stabilized the plasma. You're all idiots, you're all liars, you made it all up. No, they just haven't worked out how to stabilize the plasma yet. Well put by Lee again. Now the physicist has a question for James, and it's a good one. Jim, you're now head of N NSF, and you have five, fifty billion dollars to spend in the next 10 years on origins of life, and you get to decide who gets the money. <laughs> what, what do you want to happen? Because I, I didn't, I know what you don't want to happen, but I don't know what you do want. And someone was talking about wanting something. I think that was you. Yeah. Okay, so, so let me. <laughs> and, and I don't want to have any, argue, I don't want to hear anything about what people, yeah, I don't, I don't want you to say as an answer, and this is not fair, because I'm, <laughs> I don't want you to say, I don't want those guys <laughs> who are doing bad science. 
I want you to say what you do want. What positive could happen with that $50 billion? So I would not make that decision myself. I think it would be wrong to make that decision. I, I think that, that we would have to convene people from the community and outside the community to make that assessment. What a cop-out. James Tour, the brave whistleblower with all the answers, who has spent several years telling all the origin of life researchers in the world that they're clueless morons who haven't done a single thing to advance the field in 70 years. The smartest boy in class. What would he do with the field? He has no idea. Not a single solitary idea. The group would have to decide because he doesn't know. And do you know why? Because he wants the entire field to cease existing. He has publicly called for the field to stop existing. He actively tells students not to enter it. It's a mean monster that he wishes would go away. He hasn't thought for a single second about what he would do if he worked in this field because that's a totally nonsensical scenario for him. He sees the entire field as epistemologically invalid. With that for context, let's watch him continue to fumble through an attempted answer. I would never designate and, and use that. I mean, and, and this, is, this is actually more realistic than you might imagine. I mean, this is a fictitious thing that you've put before me, but certainly in my own university, people have... have said, you know, if Jim Tour goes into this institute, what's he going to say with the people in evolutionary biology? Well, I would never make that decision for my colleagues myself. I would, I would put it before the community. But what I would say is that what have people been trying for many years that have not worked? Uh, Lee, Lee has said repeatedly that I just keep saying, no, that doesn't work, that doesn't work. No, what I have said repeatedly is there are things that don't work that repeatedly they've made one small molecule after another. Sorry. sorry. I really want to hear, and I'm sorry for interrupting you, but I have ADD, so I think it's okay. I love this woman. She smelled the bullshit wafting off of James since the moment they sat down for dinner, and she isn't having any of it. He just spent a minute not answering her question, so she asks it again. But I want to hear something positive, like if you were in charge, you would build an amazing laboratory, and these are the kind of, this is the way you would move forward. That's what I want to hear about. Well, well you already know what you want to hear. What? All right, you just, you just said it. I mean, no, the, no, no, I, no, I'm asking you for your ideas. I'm right. sorry. So, so I would say that, that we, we have to approach this differently. I don't know the full approach. $5 billion is a lot of money. $50 billion over 10 years is a lot of money. I mean, Origin of Life is a, is, is a, you know, it's a boutique community in, in, the, in the sense of, of where research goes. So even $50 million would be a big thrust for that program. What a loser. He fails yet again to answer the question and just pivots to one of his favorite lies. It's a boutique field. Remember when I slammed him on this in the debate and he just crapped his pants? But uh, um, what, I'm, what I would say is, okay, here's a new phenomenon. You have chiral induced spin selectivity. Dittmar Seselov just came out with a paper where that has really enhanced crystallization. So you have a new phenomenon that is really pushing in and showing how, how uh, um, chirality may come forth in small molecules. Yes, that's right. He would study CISS, a thing he never shuts up about that has nothing to do with the origin of life. It's just breathtaking getting this much of a window into Jim's little toddler brain. And with this physicist even just lightly pressing on James, you can see the demons in his toddler brain start to come out to play. I mean, some people say that it's right around the corner, and they think that that's beneficial to say that it's right around the corner. Okay. And I say it's not, but wait a minute, let me finish. No. I say it's not beneficial to be saying this all the time. It's not beneficial to the community, because yeah. if you keep telling young people, we've got this thing solved, they don't want to go into it. It's a problem. If we say we've cured cancer, we don't, we don't have to deal with this anymore, who's going to go into it? Ah, uh, yes. If we say it's solved, which nobody does, Nobody will go into it, a thing which you desperately actually want to happen. Great job, James. Lee has a bit to say regarding this question as well. First of all, what would we do with the money? I, I think it's right, you can have peer review, but let's say I have 50 billion for a day. 
Um, I don't think origin of life is quite a boutique area. I think there's a lot of good synthetic chemists who are doing things at the edge of cancer, looking at complexity and really trying, and also in, the, in, in uh, gene therapy, but there's overlap. So I think one of the things we want to do is break out of our, cult uh, sorry, out of our discipline only um, um, uh, silos. Origin of life, if you call it, is not going to be solved by a chemist or a computer scientist or a biologist. He's a bit long-winded here, but he's saying that origin of life research is interdisciplinary, something I've been trying to get James to admit for several years now. But James never listens to dumb old Dave. Let's get one more question from the physicist. How could we actually be more interesting about this and less angry by thinking if we, you can agree about how time comes into origins of life? And so that's a question for both. Why don't you go first, Lee? No, I'll let you. Okay. I've talked a lot. So, okay. so I, I mean, the numbers that I put out there are interesting in, in the sense that we don't have enough time in the universe to do many things that are needed. I mean, just for a protein to fold, we don't have enough time in the universe. But when you say that, I, I didn't understand what you meant. I mean, you mean what? That okay. life can't happen randomly. Is that what you mean? No. I said it, took, it takes beyond the universe time so, for, a, yeah. for a protein to fold. Yeah. And because of that, we have all these folded proteins that would have to occur. She's noticeably confused because what James is saying is just immaculately idiotic. Not enough time in the universe for a protein to fold? What the hell is he even saying at this point? Does he think protein folding takes trillions of years? Why? There is no context imaginable in which anything he is saying here makes an ounce of sense. Let's hear him waffle some more. Before you could ever get life. So life can't exist in our universe of a certain of, time. Of time. So there was some other influence yeah. upon them. What, what is that influence? That is a phenomenon that we're not familiar, familiar with, or it's something that we're familiar with, but we don't recognize that it can happen. Proteins fold because of electrostatic interactions between amino acid residues. Protein folding happens because of the same phenomenon that causes chemical reactions to happen. This is Biochemistry 101. James is a moron. But, but, we, but you don't think that's God? That's not one of the fun, possibilities. Fundamentally, all things have been created by him and for him. So yes, it is God. Oh. But God often puts this in a materialistic sense and allows some, some, something within our universe to act upon it. It's all God. Nothing happens without God. Great job, James. And then he predictably launches into his script about how molecules fall apart so super fast and time is the enemy. And uh, these things don't hang around very long. So you, if you have one molecule that happens to be right, that's coded well for something, that thing doesn't stick around for more than hours or maybe days, depending on that molecule. And that's it. So now you have, boom, you have this okay. very short time. So that's really interesting. This is exactly where I wanted to get to, I think. You're very interested in time. Your arguments are a lot about time. You need to find something that makes the time smaller. So that is selection. And so Jim has set up the argument really nicely. Lee jumps in and basically explains how what James said is so profoundly stupid that it sets him up to say something intelligent. So I, I will talk to two. So I think the protein folding in is, is a, a category error. And it's a bit like, if we take that table here in front of us and just photograph that table, and it's and you know thanks for the staff and doing putting everything out right. It's been disorganised a bit. Some people had something to drink, and I say right. What's the probability that table can just form without the act people of eating and drinking and being laid out and the glass has been fabricated? Of course, it's greater than the lifetime of the universe. But yet that table is there now. Now what happened? Harvard. <laughs> Harvard. Or have it. <laughs> have but, it. He explains how James doesn't understand probability and then reminds us about selection on the molecular level. But, um, but there's a really important point here that proteins do not fold in isolation. And when Jim put, talks about reactions, the reactions when they de decomposition, selection promotes um, molecules that can exist for a long enough time because you have decomposition. No decomposition, no death, no death, no life, no evolution. So you, for evolution to occur, you need selection and death. 
Careful, Lee, you know what happens when you try to make James think about systems chemistry, but there are others on the panel who need the benefit of Lee's expertise, so let's give him another moment. Just to, so there's, it's, you have networks of interaction. So molecule A reacts. It's not going to make any difference how it works. It's what it what it is. Well, it is material. It is material, and it's super important to understand. It's not magic. Okay. So let me just one second. You have reactions that can propagate in time, and they can cause their, their, They can ha the molecules can self replicate, and these repli these replicators can template themselves, and they can. They can make Roman arches, right? The Roman arch, you need to have a wooden arch template, and it's arches on arches on arches. And the way we get to proteins is not this big combinatorial space. It's by scaffolding. And you start really simple, and then that produces a more complex artifact that survives in time and builds these arches. Look at our society. We're building arches in language, in energy, in technology. Very elegantly put, and the central theme of abiogenesis I've been trying to get James to acknowledge all along. Any bets as to whether it will register? And physicists do not think simply about time. That's, that's not true, just because I know you're very, you're, very, you're very worried about people saying things that aren't true. <laughs> okay, maybe we'll... Like... It's like an outtake from The Office. Priceless. On to the closing remarks. Lee goes first. The reason I came here wasn't to defend origin of life or prebiotic chemistry, far from it, is to basically say that the, we have to point out the problems we have. And these problems are not catastrophic failure. They are evidence of success that science is progressing. There are new ideas coming. Assembly theory may be fantastic, it may not be. But if we're not bold and we don't actually make out, come up with new ideas that can be demonstrably built upon, destroyed, and made better. We are not going to be doing science. And I think very strongly that we need to, be, we need to have critical discourse about what does this mean, what can we measure, uh, what can we refute, and how we can bring people across and go across this divide. In science, I want to develop new ways of doing science. I want to go across. I'm not just a chemist. I like robotics. I, like, I want to learn some physics. If you're more interested in that, that's great. And maybe some mathematics as well. So it's incumbent upon us to basically bring all the energy from humanity who wants to be involved in, not exclude them by being overcritical and basically saying, ha ha, you've failed. You're a joker, clueless, ridiculous, don't exist, rather than well done, that's a good idea, it didn't stand, didn't stand up to scrutiny here. Here's how you failed, here's how you might do better. These subtle digs at James probably seem a bit subdued if you're used to my content, but it's Harvard, so we'll take what we can get. Now for James. So I, I apologize if I came across as angry. I really do. I mean, I am passionate about everything. I'm passionate with my grandchildren, ask me a question, and I'm just... You're just what, James? What do you do when your grandchildren ask you a question? Do you do this? Mr. Farina, it. zero! It's not passion that fuels your outbursts, James. You're just batshit insane. What you're passionate about is slandering scientists and misrepresenting their work. So I wasn't angry at all. So if you thought I was angry, I wasn't angry at all. I'm not angry at Lee. In fact, uh, I'm happy that he came. I worked very hard to get you to come here. And uh, uh, I'm glad that you came and I'm not angry at anybody. I don't, I don't think that scientists that work in dis origin of life are disingenuous. Origin of life research is a scam. I don't think, you know, many people have asked me, oh, are they doing this? I mean, Christians ask me, are they doing this because, you know, they want to somehow exclude God? I don't know any scientists that wake up in the morning and think, how can I exclude God today through my work? How can I prove that he, he doesn't exist? Of course not. Real scientists don't do that. But you wake up every day and think about how you can lie about science to prove that your God exists. So I don't think that they're intentionally doing anything wrong. I do think it is wrong in an area to say that we've got this thing solved when we don't have it solved. Literally nobody in the field says that. When experiment after experiment, it's becoming harder and harder for us. And so, and I, and I have seen changes in the publications of my colleagues when they're writing their papers, on, uh, when they talk about the origin of life. They're a lot more measured now in their claims and in what they say. James is so delusional that he thinks researchers in this field are tempering their language in their publications because of what he might say about it. Yeah, just like how biologists are worried about what Kent Hovind will say. 
I'm sure that you would agree that is a good thing. If you tell young people that we've got this thing solved, it hurts the field because who wants to go into it? And, uh, and, and so I'm not upset with anybody. I'm not angry. I am passionate, and, and uh, I apologize if I hurt anybody's feelings. Apologize to you, Lee, if I hurt your feelings about this. But, uh, um, uh, you know, I, I'm not sure how I can curtain this, but... but Look at how humiliated and apologetic James is. He's using his entire closing remark to do nothing but apologize for being a raving lunatic. It must be a humbling experience. After spending so long preaching to science illiterate imbeciles and having your ego built up, to then have to defend your script of lies in front of intelligent, educated people at Harvard who fortunately for him are more polite than I am, or it would have been another unhinged display of shouting. You can be sure of that. But, but uh, feel sorry for my wife. I mean, it's a, th think of what you, the poor lady's got to go through. Oh, we do, James. We do. But I've, I've been married 42 years, and, and, uh, and, and you know, we're together, and we're happy, and we, we, we're in the same home. We have four kids together. So it, it couldn't be all bad. And that's the end. James very fittingly spent his entire final remark saying absolutely nothing scientific whatsoever, affirming for the entire audience that he was never there for science in the first place. Immaculate. Anyway, that's the end of this fiasco. It's hard to imagine why the DI thought this would be a good idea, as though any real academics would take Jim's side. Perhaps they thought he could get away with his script if they didn't press him too hard. And indeed, they let him get away with a lot. But even their mild, civil criticism was humiliating enough. It didn't go quite as poorly for him as our debate at Rice, but you can bet that it isn't going to get any better than this in front of any audience that isn't his brainwashed flock. And of course, his brainwashed flock thinks he knocked this one out of the park as always. A trip through the comments section of this video is as disheartening as any experience imaginable and makes me doubt the future of mankind. It's full of science illiterate morons praising James for his faith in Jesus totally oblivious as to how badly he just humiliated himself. I hereby officially rank James Tour fans as dumber than flat earthers. They are that pathetic. At any rate, James has really committed himself to the path of shameless apologist preacher, so we can count on more pathetic stunts from him, which means you can count on more commentary from me. I'll see you next time.